Welcome back, Neta. Thank you again for doing this tonight. And maybe, yeah, we start with this peculiar Abendbrot. Um, what's the deal with the Abendbrot? <laughs> Why are we doing this? I d felt and I said to Daniela when we spoke about uh, doing the show here that when we premiered the performance in, in Jerusalem in July, I insisted on having a coffee mit Kuchen <laughs> for the audience. There was a whole <laughs> section uh, that took place in the garden, and, and I looked on the internet for the kind of tea cart from wood that, that look, would look like the kind that my grandparents would have, and looked for the plates and the it was really cool but then Daniela said <laughs> <laughs> oh no this is not uh, the, it's not a uh, coffee mit kuchen time it's more, <laughs> <laughs> it's more abendbrot so I said that's great and it's actually like when there was a birthday or uh, an occasion where the aunts or my grandparents would come over to the kibbutz or s so they would make this little Sandwiches, yeah. Damit, uh, and with this, we're already um, right in the middle of it. Um, in your memories and uh, the little bits and pieces you picked up uh, throughout your family history. Um, I was asked already in those few minutes between uh, the Abendbrot and now um, whether we would find out a bit more about how this piece came together. Wow. And um, uh, I, I have to promise the audience a short version of this because it was a bit of a <laughs> process, but maybe it would be nice to start with our meeting in Frankfurt, um, which was in 2022. It's also something that appears in the play. Um, we met on the last day of your trip to Frankfurt. You had been on a journey to Berlin and Frankfurt. And maybe could you share with the audience a little bit um, what happened during that trip, what that trip meant for you, and maybe also how it fed into um, this piece that we watched tonight. Sure. So first, I really want to thank you for for meeting me that day. <laughs> and the rest is history as we... <laughs> Uh, it was really um, special. I decided uh, to go on this trip with a, a, a red leather envelope that my grandmother uh, from my father's side, from the Berlin side, brought with her uh, in 1933. And that's something that I found. Of course, I, I don't read German. I can fake my way through like <laughs> random German words that I, are not really useful. But uh, anyway, I came with that. I decided to come alone uh, with this material and spent uh, like a week in Berlin following the traces or in going to the Jewish Museum, to the archive. I spent six hours one day with the archivist going through all the letters and stuff and donated, decided to donate the documents that were for my Berlin side of the family to the Berlin Museum, uh, to the Berlin Jewish Museum because I felt like there were stuff like a letter from Thomas Mann, which I told you about. A letter from Thomas Mann to your mother, right? To, to my grandmother. A grandmother, sorry. Yep. That is a condolences letter about this guy here. That is uh, Erwin Rosolio who wanted to be a writer. Um, and, and, so, and somehow, I don't know really the story, but he wrote this letter. So, and there are other really interesting um, pieces, so I gave that. And then I went to Frankfurt, and I and I really went from their their postcards there, uh, the, not the postcards themselves, but photos or scans of them. That's the only thing that I really have of the period of my grandmother that lived here um, until 1941, when she was deported. And then, anyway, I went everywhere. I went to Philanthropine. I arranged for a meeting with the, with the uh, 
director with the principal of philanthropy in school, Noga Hartman. And I have to say that like sitting on the bench in front of the door of her office and <laughs> waiting for the meeting, I really could like feel my mother like, okay, I'm like in trouble, you know. <laughs> anyway, so I went, I went there, I went to Beckerwigstrasse to look and really it was not there anymore, but the number was there. I went to look for the grave and the, I had the name, I, I had the date that uh, my grandfather was born and the date that he was killed. So I went to the graveyard and I said, this is, can you please tell me where it is? And he put out a print, I swear, <laughs> like a computer paper. And I looked at it and it was the wrong date of birth and the wrong date of death. So I said, I really said, no, it's the wrong Leopold Fleischer. You have to look again. So it's true. And then on the last day, I got uh, the email from you or, or the day before that you are coming back. And we met at the Museum of Modern Art because I was going to see the Duchamp exhibit, <laughs> which I love Duchamp, not related to my history. <laughs> and we spoke and it was really, um, is, it was really a, a great meeting and also really moving because Daniela asked, have you been to the memorial, to a, which I can't say the words. Uh, Großmarkthalle an der EZB. And I said, no, I haven't. And she said, you have to see it. And we went together. It was raining. <laughs> and it was so amazing for me to, to see the memorial um, with you. And then that's how it all started. And the, oh, and I didn't answer. So, so the part where I go, I went. I went looking for you. Da 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 da. That's the first section that I made after I returned from the Frankfurt trip. Mm. So I think from the way you're talking about it, it's already quite clear uh, how personal and um, maybe even private uh, some parts of the. Um, a conception of this or uh, conceiving this piece was. Um, at the same time, the title, the archive, suggests something um, almost objective, maybe canonical. Um, archives, you know, um, gathering historical facts maybe or turning something um, private, personal into something commonly memorized or into a common narrative universal to keep. So there's already this tension there between a very mm, subjective and, and private um, core of the piece and then working with this method of the archive. Um, you do this with letters and artifacts with your very personal archive of your family history, um, but also by, by using the method in the play of showing us exhibit, right. et cetera, et cetera. Um, would you like to uh, go deeper into the personal part and share with the audience a bit about your family history? Or is the point not to? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I mean, I, can, I, I think it would be interesting for you to know that really there are two, like the two tables. There, there is the Berlin part of the family of my father's side and the Frankfurt side, which is my mother's side. And, uh, and I, I had less materials ab about my mother because she didn't speak and also she left at in 19. There is a story that I, I cut out because there was so much material um, to go through that, that eventually when you construct a work like this, what I was concerned with is how memory works and to structure the evening in a way, the, the show, not really chronological in any way, but really how we remember things. So the Abendbrot reminds you of a 
of someone you know, which reminds you of a letter they wrote, which reminds you of a song, which remind so that's how I structured it. Um, <coughs> so the, f the Frankfurt, I, d I didn't know much, but um, I do know that uh, my mom left in uh, May of 1939 by, by herself, um, and that her mother accompanied her to the train station, um, to the Frankfurt Central train station. She was uh, uh, about to leave for Palestine with a group of teenagers. She was 15 herself. 15. Mm. And at that point, her father, my grandfather, was already gone because he died in 1938. Um, and so the mother, my grandmother, Paulina Fleischer, remained in Frankfurt. And uh, my mother received a few postcards, those, and then the postcard stopped. And what we know from later, and she researched it, that the, my grandmother was deported on November 1941 to Riga, and, the, and nobody from that group came back. Um, so that's that's really the the story of and the, her brother Julius Fleischer uh, escaped to London about the same time with the Kinder transport. He studying in philanthropin some mechanical job, so it was possible to get a certificate to go to England. And he actually had a family in England, so I have cousins from that side. And uh, yeah, and I think in all honesty, I think that my mother, uh, the weight of of thinking all her life, that I don't know from her, that I know from my father, but the weight of her thinking all her life that her father killed himself uh, and that she was the last person that saw him and the weight of knowing that she couldn't do anything to get her mother out affected her all her life. So that, that kind of hovers over. And because she, over the work, and because she didn't speak at all about, which is not rare, I think a lot of people of that generation didn't speak. I really began to find out things only after she passed away. Yeah. That with looking at things. So I did find a picture of her her brother and her mother. Um, and then the, the Berlin side of the family um, fared better because uh, my grandparents were, the, were Zionists. Um, they were both doctors, uh, a very well-off uh, family. I think one of the grandfathers was a very big director in the Victoria <laughs> uh, Insurance Company, and you read the letter. It's somewhere over there. You can read it. Um, and and uh, what my grandmother told me that in 1933 there were uh, communist riots, right? The and uh, my my grandfather took care of some people that got hurt and didn't report to the police. And one of his patients that was already uh, in the party uh, called him up and says, Dr. Pulmacher, you have to leave tonight because you're on the blacklist. And so my grandmother, Tilly, always told me, because since she was a doctor, she could, she got 12 teddy bears. I just remember this story. 12 teddy bears, there was three children. She spliced the bellies like a good surgeon and put stuff, valuables in there, and spread the teddy bears in the suitcases. They told the children, my dad was at the time 13, his sister was 11, and the little one was 2. So they told them that they were going on vacation to Switzerland. 
and waited for their certificates to go to Palestine, to, which was under British rule. And, and then they made it. And also the, the great-grandparents left, the Victoria guy. And my father said he had two grandmothers. He had Klarchen, this whose who's, uh, postcard is this beautiful woman that is in the postcard that you can take, which I decided it was the most beautiful woman in Berlin <laughs> in, at the time, <laughs> which he loved. And then there was the other grandmother. That's what he said. They called her the other grandmother, which her name was Elsa Pulvermacher. So there was the Rosolio side and the Pulvermacher side. There is more stories, so many. <laughs> and some I abandoned. Like there was this character that I read a very, like I had a letter translated from 29 that Moritz Rosolio wrote to Werner Rosolio, which, which was already in Palestine, about an incident that probably happened much earlier, a woman by the name of El Zalam. And at first I was sure when, the, when I read the translation that God forbid Moritz, my great grandfather, had an affair with his El Zalam. <laughs> but no, it wasn't that. But anyway, I abandoned that story because it, I just couldn't. So, would you say that um, the theatrical expression that you found tonight with this piece, the archive, um, is that a family's? Is that an expression of a family's memory, or um, is that creating a family's memory, or is that something else altogether? It's it's in a way it's it's uh, it's kind of I'm thinking about it as a, a cinema in 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 which. Uh, because if I look at the material um, cinematically, I I can have close-ups, like uh, and then and then wide zooms, and in a way, it it I sense or I I believe that the way we remember things is kind of cinematically, like an image would would com be combined with a music and a gesture and a memory and an image. Um, so the way that the work is, is both e extremely personal and it was important for me to go there, but at the same time the text is written, it's, it's, mm. it's shaped. It's in order to become universal I had to go really deep and, it, and then investigate the way that letters, old documents that, that the person who generated them is no longer here. How can I create an experience that you can then generate your own memories based on this long forgotten document or picture? Because this idea for me was to create new memories that are related for you, f that are related to these artifacts and half traces and half memories so that these artifacts and these names won't disappear into oblivion, if that makes sense. Besides the part that I wanted to just find out more about my family, so that there's really a lot of layers. A constant push and pull between yeah. what we started with as well, the, the private, the personal, and then this transformation process into a universal notion, into... Um, a common memory or, um, or narrative um, that has a more uh, universal uh, application almost. Is this what you would call a post-memory journey? What you yes. Is the term that you use to describe your method? I um, kind of found it as I was having to write all these grants to get the funding for <laughs> 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 You know, that's reality. <laughs> um, so I read, <laughs> I, s I read really materials about this idea of memories and like and, and post memories and trauma and and, and post memory is really the is it what it means. It means that really I personally don't have 
uh, experiences with with Frankfurt, like with that time. And I don't have a, a direct experience with the artifacts and with the letters, but I create, what is a post memory? I pick like a certain photograph or a certain document or an aspect of it and point the, the sort of the light or the attention. I, pay, I point the attention into it and by doing that, it rescues it, it creates an experience and then it rescues it from, from forgetfulness. Because it, post memory also deals with the fact that nowadays it's not really difficult to press on Google images and look for images of any kinds if 1939, 40, 41, da, da. They're so, it's the forgetfulness that post memory is trying to deal with or this piece is trying to deal with is not related to not having documents necessarily, but sometimes it's having so many documents available, digital documents, that they're not anchored in experience. It's very easy to just like in the, <laughs> in the apps, like go foo, 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 and you forget them. And by creating a, an experience with a tangible, like with paper, with song, with, with Abendbrot, with this and that, it anchors it, it situates the documents, the memories, the half traces in something that would stay, I think, mm. it for a brief moment, would leave a little longer. Mm. I like this idea because basically um, what you're explaining here is uh, your understanding of what an archive can be and um, especially considering also ephemeral artifacts, uh, consider a voice as part of an archive, consider a taste as part of an archive. Um, uh, of course, we always ask this question of preservation, how to continue, how to pass it on, but um, maybe that's not the point altogether. So um, you let us uh, ramage, let me use this term, yeah. ramage through um, parts of your archive. I mean, we used a lot of copies, of course, um, yeah. uh, but that also doesn't matter because it is basically you wanted to provide the audience uh, the opportunity to go through part of a process that is your personal process is also gen generously sharing your own um, and experience. to feel like ha because I don't know about you but I like to rummage through old letters and old postcards and maybe I find like this really interesting story or it's just interesting people's lives are fascinating and this appears in the archive uh, which is the piece we watched tonight it appears almost as ghosts, is I think a word that you used yesterday, um, yeah. ghosts that appear and disappear. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship um, or again also this method of using something um, uh, structured like an archive, like exhibit one, two, three, um, with the appearance of shadows, memories, ghosts? How th does that play together for you? Because the First of all, archives, like, the, I'm thinking now about, about the one, but generally speaking, but the one archive where we premiered the work um, in Jerusalem was really small and it had these thick, uh, you know, folders with like really in German printed all, like I remember with Yonit, we went there and that's when, when we got the, I got the idea of calling it the archive because I said, this is it, this is it. It's like, because all is folders mm -hmm. had so many ghosts <laughs> in them. Mm -hmm. and, and also I went in there and the first thing my eye caught was Hannah Arndt fold, like three folders uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, and I opened it, they let me, which not a lot of archives do. <laughs> <laughs> and there was the original New Yorker, uh, uh, that's where she wrote the first article that became then the book, 
it was like chilling. And it, but there were so many things there. And then they had a volunteer, Philip, great guy from Germany, a teenager that was doing a gap here. And he snuck me into the archive one more time. And he had to show me this. There was a, a playbill from Spain. It was amazing. Like I was considering doing it and using it for, for the flyer for the show, but no. Um, so in thinking about what, <laughs> I, I lost track. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Look, basically, um, I was I was wondering about the relationship between the archival goods, so to say, and and the ghosts of the piece. Oh, because but any archive is, and and th in this way, this whole house, even though it's not villa, it's not an archive. It is. I mean, I'm sure, and I I'm sure that that if the walls could talk, you know what I mean. It. it there are so many memories embedded in the materials, especially you know in the materials, in the structure, in the in the landscape. It, you, you kind of just have to listen to it. That's um, uh, and actually, I wanted to talk to you about this because um, I mean, most of the uh, people in the audience. I see a lot of faces that have been here before. Not everyone has. Um, let me just very, very briefly uh, summarize uh, the biography of this building, which is, which has its own story and its own history. And it was built in 1912 as a very private, very personal family home um, of a captain at the time with his wife. And then later, the Jewish family, the Sontheimers, moved in with four daughters. Um, this was a home to people. Here were fights. Um, <laughs> Love, uh, dinner, Abendbrot for sure. Um, soirees, also a very cultured family opening the doors to literary evenings and readings. Um, so it started off very personal, very private. And then with the Sontheimers leaving on time, uh, emigrating through Den Haag into uh, New York actually, um, it was also the moment when the function of this building shifted into something uh, more public more um, uh, official, I guess. Um, the uh, <coughs> Nazi regime implemented offices here, um, also archives, actually. Um, the some archive documents from the university were stored in the basement. Um, also, this was supposed to become uh, uh, arboretum, uh, so a research wow. facility for herbal and plants um, closely linked to the botanical gardens just behind. So this is really the moment where the biography of this building shifts from personal, um, from private, into something public or semi-public. And um, to see what happens with this building, with meeting with your piece and uh. coming together with it, was uh, something we were very curious about um, <laughs> artistically. And now um, we are also curious how you perceived, I mean, you already mentioned if the walls could speak, um, but what, do, what did you see when you came here? Because maybe it's interesting for the audience to know that the entire piece was developed remotely and we only started working on site uh, basically on Friday. Um, because yeah right yeah, this is important yeah. to say um so really these past days you have uh tried different things and yeah changed and my mind moved through every meter of the floor <laughs> and we've changed settings a million times so maybe can you talk a little bit about yeah what it means to do the archive which was developed and first shown in jerusalem now here in frankfurt um in the villa as a such a specific space for it, it's it's a may it uh, first of all it is really really amazing for me to to do it to perform it and to premiere this version here because there's so many things about about this site this location that are present without me having to say a word. That's what it feels to me. It situates the, it, and gives context, context without any effort. 
if if that makes sense. It just it's sort of like f it's, it's in a sense it feels like coming home. Even it, like I like I could I could say to you, welcome to my archive. Hmm. And even though it's not, I had my family didn't live here, but it it really is because it's a site that has so much memory and history. And and uh, the, it, the kind of, it's beautiful. It's just a beautiful sight. And the wood and the, I could really see there is a picture, Ralph, the, <laughs> the cello, the exhibit one. When <laughs> when he, it looks almost, although it was in Berlin, but it looked, could have been taken here in one of the soirees. And, and I could go on more. You know, it just, it felt that it, it, it really provided me the opportunity, the rare opportunity to focus even more this work, the archive. So to, to make it really, really inhabit this location, this site. That's also one reason why you were hoping for a smaller audience as well, um, which is why we yeah. reduced the number of seats, yeah, the intimacy. Um, now, um, is this for you, is it a paradox that theatre performances are ephemeral kinds of forms oh, of wow. art? Um, when, when we turn, really what happened, you turn fleeting memories and their fluidity <laughs> into, into another into something permanent by using the archive and making a piece called the archive yet it's a performance piece that will then disappear with all of you taking it home um, is this for you a paradox or is that exactly the point i think it's exactly the point because it's in a way it's it's a it's it's sort of a metaphor for for life for the f for the fleetingness of of this moment, of this meeting, of this time. It's so brief. Like I, I always say to my students, like, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> it doesn't even matter. You know, we just don't. So, so permanence in this world is impermanence. You know, it's like the change is, is, and, and, what you can hold on to for real is an experience it's a memory but but and and that always i think is really interesting for me it's what's left after the real the, the thing and to that's like uh, i love this painter um wait a second he's german <sighs> anselm kaifer mm -hmm. Anselm Kiefer, yeah. Kiefer. He, he, he really does, like, his work is amazing because he does that. He, like, that's his concern. He, I think. Mm. And, and so, <laughs> I, I mean, that's what I got from it. And so, for me, it's always, like, the thing which is not there tells you more about what is there you know, what was or what could be, which is always amazing. Like, to f and I always think about it when I create, like, what could it be? And I, I, and I make a whole 10 minutes, 15 minutes section, and the next day I was like, oh, what could that be more? And then it goes, <laughs> and the traces of the 15 minutes maybe become the thing. You know, I ha we have to go through. So archive. I think we each, our lives, and our mind and our memories are are, are archives. In, in, in certain, and it's really interesting to also think about what we remember and what we forget, because we certainly don't remember everything. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, I'm going to close our conversation yes. with these words and these thoughts. Um, so maybe that's the key to never stop looking for the gaps in the memory and uh, acknowledge them. Um, 
thank you so much, Neta, for sharing your process, your experience with us, for inviting us here to your kind of Abendbrot. Um, we have uh, a little gift for you, no flowers, because Neta's flying back tomorrow. Oh. So this is for you and for <gasps> thank Unit. You. And, um, thank you. Thank you. A round of applause. <laughs> wow. Thank I would... Uh, I would uh, like to thank you both very much for making this uh, such a wonderful experience with us these past days here at Villa um, for turning this into your temporary home for hosting this soiree with us. Um, thank you, Unit, also for your careful and uh, wonderful support as a, as a stage producer, so to say, in our um, not so common stage. <laughs> um, It, äh, ein großes Dankeschön möchte ich auch aussprechen gegenüber der jüdischen Gemeinde, ähm, ein langjähriger Partner ähm, äh, der KfW-Stiftung, mit denen wir hier im Haus immer mal wieder auch Veranstaltungen machen, die uns im Prozess hier auch unterstützt haben. Ähm, ein ganz herzliches Dankeschön. Ähm, Ira Haller, Susanna Schacker ähm, und natürlich auch Herr Grünbaum, dann ähm, möchte ich auch sehr herzlich danken den vielen Köpfen in der KfW-Stiftung, die geraucht haben. Ähm, ganz, wir sind ein kleines Team, also rauchen alle Köpfe. Äh, ganz herzlichen Dank dafür, ganz besonders aber an Marie Scharschmidt, ohne die dieser Abend hier sicherlich nicht hätte stattfinden können. Und äh, natürlich die Techniker, äh, die sich auch genauso wie wir auf dieses Experiment eingelassen haben in den letzten Tagen, ähm, die Villa, die keine Bühne ist, in eine Bühne zu verwandeln. Ähm, Kunst an Orten, wo sie keine Selbstverständlichkeit ist, ist immer ein besonders spannender Prozess. Thank you, Neta, for uh, joining this um, endeavor with us. Und vielen Dank an alle, die daran beteiligt waren. Um, zum Abschluss, liebes Publikum, ein ganz herzliches Dankeschön an Sie. Uh, wir wünschen Ihnen einen schönen Abend. Kommen Sie gut nach Hause. Danke, dass Sie gekommen sind, trotz Regen und Streik. Und uh, kommen Sie wieder. Die uh, nächste, nächste größere Programmpunkt bei uns uh, am 3. Mai eröffnen wir die Ausstellung mit Gael Schwarzne im Rahmen der Ray Fotografie Triennale. Dazu laden wir Sie schon jetzt sehr herzlich ein, aber schauen Sie auch mal auf die Website. Es gibt auch immer wieder Angebote zu Führungen und dergleichen. Jetzt genug der Eigenwerbung. Vielen Dank. Nehmen Sie diese Erfahrung von heute Abend mit nach Hause. Kommen Sie gut heim und bis bald. Dankeschön. I want to say thank you. Oh. Wait, wait. I would like I I would like this moment to to really thank Daniela uh, oh and, and 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 Marie and Rose and everyone at KFW but mostly you for for your trust. Because there was no because there was there was really not much when we first spoke. It was a mutual trust. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So it means a lot. Thank you, Nita. Yes. Thank you. Comes good Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. There was really none. <laughs>